Broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne, this is Wilms Front, brought to you by theunshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wilms. We're here today on the 11th of November 2019 at the County Court of Victoria to hear Patriot activist Blair Cottrell's appeal trial against his 2017 blasphemy conviction under Victoria's Racial and Religious Tolerance Act 2002. He was charged for performing and uploading to Facebook a mock beheading of a dummy outside the Bendigo Council uh, during the construction of a mosque. Uh, it was during the United Patriots Front activism in the city uh, during 2015. The Magistrates Court uh, trial uh, took uh, place in September uh, 2017. Uh, the three of them, there were, as they were known, the Bendigo Three, Blair Cottrell, Neil Erickson and Christopher Shortis, uh, they were uh, found guilty. Uh, Blair Cottrell had a conviction recorded against him and they were fined $2,000 each. And that was for inciting uh, serious uh, contempt, ridicule and revulsion against Muslims. Blair decided to appeal uh, his uh, conviction and employed the services of Patriot lawyer John Bolton. They were originally challenging the conviction on the grounds that Victoria's Racial and Religious Tolerance Act is constitutionally invalid under Australia's implied right to freedom of political communication. Given that it was a matter of constitutional law, they uh, directed first to lodge an appeal with the High Court of Australia. Uh, in December 2018, the High Court uh, directed John Bolton and Blair Cottrell to go back to the County Court of Victoria to lodge their appeal. The High Court would not hear the case until all other avenues of appeal had been exhausted by either side. In June this year, Vic Vic Victorian Attorney General Jill Hennessy joined the Director of Public Prosecutions in the appeal proceedings. This was due to uh, the government's belief that defending the validity of the Racial and Religious Tolerance Act was necessary to protect all laws against hate speech and to safeguard community cohesion, but then the Victorian government admitted that Cottrell's conviction under the Racial and Religious Tolerance Act uh, might conflict with its own charter of human rights and responsibilities, specifically the human right to freedom of expression and the freedom of political discourse. The appeal trial was originally set to take place in on August the 12th, however the original trial judge uh, Lisa Hannon could not hear the case as scheduled as she accepted a new appointment as Chief Magistrate of the uh, Magistrate Court of Victoria. A rescheduled trial is now taking place on Monday today. It is being heard by the Chief Judge of the County Court of Victoria, Peter Kidd. Blair himself will be giving evidence and will also be cross-examined. The legal process is always slow, at, but we are finally at the trial. Depending on the verdict, this trial might be the only the beginning of this uh, legal uh, battle over free speech. This is Wilms Front, brought to you by theunshackled.net. So day two of Blair Cottrell's appeal trial over his uh, conviction under Section 25.2 of Victoria's Racial and Religious Tolerance Act has uh, wrapped up. Uh, so basically what we've heard so far is the, the evidence uh, of the, uh, the case uh, to convict him. So that's basically looking at the original uh, Facebook video of the, the mock beheading and the additional marching and promotional footage Afterwards, uh, Blair Cottrell took the stand himself. He was uh, examined by his lawyer, uh, John Bolton, then cross-examined by the uh, DPP uh, prosecutor and then uh, re-examined. Uh, Basically, what it all boils down to is uh, where what, what the, the prosecution is trying to prove that uh, uh, Blair Cottrell's intent was to incite uh, revulsion, uh, ridicule and serious contempt uh, for Muslims as a class of people. It all comes down to intent in this uh, specific section. Uh, so we heard the closing uh, remarks this afternoon by the uh, DPP prosecutor and we also heard from a representative of the Attorney General's uh, department basically saying that it's not just uh, they're, they're not just challenging this Blair Cottrell and John Bolton on the evidence itself but also on the based on the Victorian Charter of Human Rights and Responsibilities uh, 2006 so the State Attorney General's representative talked about how in enacting the Racial and Religious Tolerance Act 2002 uh, it was only meant to apply to the, the most extreme contemptuous forms of realification to uh, incite uh, hatred and that the, the Charter of Human Rights and Responsibilities, although it 
it guarantees uh, freedom of expression, it has to balance out uh, the freedom to uh, freedom from uh, harassment and intimidation and vilification. Uh, so the Charter of Human Rights and Responsibilities is, is as you described, is basically about a balancing act. It's about to rain uh, here outside the, the county court. This is uh, day two. Day three uh, tomorrow uh, will be uh, John Bolton making his closing arguments and then it will get on to the, the constitutional uh, case. So there still could be another at least a day or maybe uh, another uh, two days. But that's it for today. I'll keep you updated. This is Will's Front, brought to you by the Unshackled.net. We've just concluded uh, day three of Blair Cottrell's appeal trial against uh, his uh, conviction under uh, Section 25.2 of Victoria's Racial and Religious Tolerance Act. Uh, that is for uh, inciting uh, revulsion, uh, ridicule and serious uh, contempt for Muslims. Uh, uh, this was the, the mock uh, beheading uh, stunt that the United Patriots Front uh, performed outside the Bendigo City Council in uh, 2015. Now, this case has been talked a lot about uh, the, the free speech implications for, for, for Australia but I've been observing this uh, case for, for three days now and there is no right to free speech uh, in Australia. We have what's called an implied right to political uh, communication which is actually not a personal right. It's that it's a restriction on legislation uh, so that it does not burden that freedom of uh, political communication. So. Free speech in Australia, it doesn't exist and it's not actually on trial here. This is a question of whether Blair had the intent to incite a whole class of persons in Muslims and whether he was engaged in political communication. His lawyer, John Bolton, has uh, just wrapped up uh, his uh, closing uh, arguments. Uh, I've got uh, Blair here with me now. Uh, your uh, appeal well, there's still the, the, the prosecutor to make her constitutional uh, arguments. Uh, so we've had the, you're appealing both uh, your uh, conviction on the charges and there is also the Charter of Human Rights and Responsibility Victorias and also the constitutional matter. So there's three separate elements to this appeal. Yeah, um, and I think we're most likely to get a victory on the first element. That is uh, my intention. And that's what I've been charged with, essentially, my intention. Uh, not with any of the conduct I engaged in specifically, but what my intent was when I engaged in the conduct. And that's going to be the easiest, the easiest one to win, in my opinion. The other two, it's, it's very up in the air. Because, as Tim said, there's, there's no right to freedom of expression or free speech or anything in Australia. Not, in, not implicitly. It's like, uh, it has to be argued, and as you said, it's a restriction on legislation. Uh, it's more, it's easier to say that it wasn't my intent to incite ridicule of Muslims than for me to say it's my right to freely ridicule Muslims in Australia because I have free speech, you know, so uh, I think it's demonstrated that I'm more likely to win on the first point because after I was cross-examined by the state prosecutor, uh, she asked the judge to not listen to anything I said, not believe anything he said, and that nothing I said matters, which indicates that everything I said was good for my defence. Okay, so if a judge finds me guilty tomorrow, what he's essentially saying is he thinks I'm lying, he thinks everything I said in the witness box is a lie, mostly everything, and that I'm guilty because I got up in the morning and intended to go incite ridicule and revulsion and uh, contempt of Muslim people, and that's all there is to it. Uh, we could still win on the constitutional matter and the Charter of Rights matter after that. The legislation could be limited, restricted, reformed in some way in order to grant some freedom of political discourse as a result of this case, but I don't think that's likely at this stage. I think, I think it's much more likely that I'll win on the, uh, uh, on the first matter of intent. Uh, however, the law is against me. Uh, the law is against us all as regular working Australians and it has been since 1992 and that's important to understand. The Racial and Religious Tolerance Act uh, s essentially has written in it that diversity is our strength in Australia, that multiculturalism makes Australian society stronger and it's important for all persons to be able to participate equally and yada yada yada, okay. It uses that nice kind of language to disguise its true purpose, okay. Its true purpose in my view was to deracinate 
traditional Australia and to essentially ethnically replace Australians by any and all means. And that's been the physical result if you just pay attention to what's happening around you. So uh, when you hear politicians and uh, activists of any kind, bureaucrats in the media or governments say that diversity is our greatest strength in Australia, that's not just a, a, a political slogan, it's the fucking law. And I found that out by going through this process, my appeal process. Diversity is not just a state propaganda slogan. It's not just a, uh, a dogmatic piece of le uh, dogmatic opinion of some politician. It's legislated into law and has been since 1992. And there's been various amendments to it to make it worse, worse and worse ever since. Now, if you think about it, 1992 was how long ago? 27 years ago. 27 years ago, which is more than enough time to educate a single generation of students in the schools, right? Now, this is uh, relevant because in the Racial and Religious Tolerance Act, it says, plain and simple, the primary purpose for this piece of legislation is not legal, but educational. That means that the purpose of the Act from the beginning, the purpose of the Bill, was not to provide legal protection for people, minority groups who feel they've been vilified or the uh, victim of racist attack or anything like that. The primary purpose was a brainwashing process. That's what it was for. It was for schools, it was for television, it was for a cultural application. And that was 27 years ago. And what's been the result? Well, coincidentally, now we have a new generation of young adults running around calling themselves transsexuals, Marxists, feminists, homosexuals, and all different types of, uh, uh, you know, new, uh, you know, various types of new identities and that kind of thing. And that's, in my view, been a direct result of this piece of legislation which disguises itself as a nice humanitarian thing that the community needed. But that's not what it was from the beginning. And it's been interesting engaging in this whole process because that's been made um, irrefutable to me. It's, it's, it's sort of been brought to my attention and I never knew it, so. Well, I'm going to bring it back from uh, that overall your hypothesis of what you just said then yeah. is that their interpretation the victorian government who who, pa who passed it is that they respect <coughs> free speech but what they've accused you of through this beheading study is that you've and it's the whole video itself because there's the music over there's uh you marching and there's also the uh, driving uh, open uh with the car and that's and I, I can see this myself, that lay people see it as that could scare, intimidate or threaten people from engaging in their free expression. So if they're arguing that that video that will discourage people, whether fairly or unfairly, from participating in their own free expression and in the, the democratic process because again this freedom of political communication is about responsible and representative government it's not about free speech absolutist so what do you say to that so a video of me mocking an illegal act of beheading people and marching down the street with flags in the view of the prosecution from their point of view intimidated other people from engaging in political process I don't agree with that I think the main class of people a group of people who have been intimidated from engaging in political process are working, voting white Australian people who are concerned with the future of their country and are particularly concerned with what they view as the destruction of traditional Australia. We've been the subject of ridicule and intimidation. Like, I can't see how, like, this is something I've found that's, um, it's consistent with all of the accusations against me. Whatever I'm accused of is generally what the accuser is doing to me. So I'm accused of intimidating people into silence by the prosecution. Is that what you're saying? that you've intimidated people, but you're arguing that it's your followers who've been intimidated. Yeah, absolutely. Like in, if I were a regular person who was less concerned with personal consequence, I probably should have been intimidated too. But I wasn't, and that's why I'm still at court. I mean, I was expected to just wear this charge and be intimidated into silence along with the, my other colleagues, but, you know, obviously it didn't work on me. But, you know, I don't, I don't understand how you know, mocking an illegal act beheading people and then marching down the street with flags should be regarded as criminal because it's going to scare other people. It doesn't make sense to me. Now, of course, it all comes down to, uh, we've talked about the, the Charter of Rights and the constitutional matter. It all comes down to, this is what the legislation says, intent, which is basically they've got to get into your mind. And this is the first time this part of the legislation has been used because it's a criminal uh, provision, which you could go to jail for uh, six months. Yeah. And as 
It's interesting to me that they're wanting to amend uh, this act now. Fiona Patton's introduced the Racial and Religious Tolerance Amendment, yeah. which is getting rid of this intent because it was quite a vigorous cross-examination by the, the state prosecutor where uh, she tried to put it to you that you must have known your intent and the reaction that you wanted. You've claimed that it wasn't about Muslims and the, the mosque, it was all about local government corruption. Yeah, it was about like, it was about local government corruption and also about a specific type of Muslim extremism, obviously, like beheading people. But uh, the state prosecutor, during my cross-examination, wanted me to say what she wanted me to say. And she continued to ask me the same question in different forms to try to get me to say what she wanted me to say. And because I wouldn't say it, she then asked the judge to not listen to anything I said. Don't believe anything he says, Your Honour, it doesn't matter. You know. But uh, she also accused me of being evasive. But realistically, I was, I was answering the questions as honestly as I could. The state prosecution is trying to, uh, you know, together with the Attorney General's office, they're trying to oversimplify the entire matter to say that Muslims are one class of people and that by staging a mock beheading in order to criticise whether it was local government corruption at the time of the building of the mosque or uh, that particular extremist Islamic practice, that that is ridiculing and inciting contempt and revulsion of all Muslim people, regardless of what different sects and uh, factions of Muslims believe, okay? I've put it to the prosecution that not all Muslim people are the same, and to conflate all Muslim people with the act of beheading is wrong, and that's not what I was doing. They've turned around and said that is what you're doing, and that nothing you say to the contrary matters. You know, so they want me to have basically gone out to incite ridicule and revulsion. They want that to have been my sole intent and they want to help the judge to understand that that was my sole intent, regardless of anything that I say, okay? So in order for the judge to rule in, uh, in, in the prosecution's favor tomorrow, the, the judge would need to basically be saying, I believe that Mr. Cottrell, me, I believe that you're lying. I believe that everything you said in the witness box was a lie and that the prosecution is correct in everything that they have told me that you think, okay? so. The prosecution claims to have gone inside my mind based on the evidence that they've put on television inside the court, the mock beheading, and they claimed to have known my intent and proven my intent regardless of me saying it wasn't my intent. So the prosecution needs to prove beyond reasonable doubt I'm a liar. And that's pretty hard to do. Like they've got, they've got their work cut out for them there. But I think they believe that they've got it. And because the law is essentially always against people like me, uh, because, you know, uh, that's, that's just the way it is in the current state of subver subverted culture, I think it's more likely the judge will rule in their favour at this stage. But like I said, regardless, I'm still glad that I engage in the process generally because I've learned a lot from it. Well, I think everybody who's been in the gallery and observed the case, it's, it's been uh, at least a quite educational about what our rights are in Victoria uh, and Australia. Uh, obviously proceedings will, will wrap up uh, tomorrow, we don't know whether we'll get a, a decision uh, then, uh, but yes, it'll, it'll certainly be, this might not be the end, we, we still don't know. Uh, whip. Obviously you're most confident on the, on the actual uh, charge, uh, but uh, there could still be more more, more to come because there's a lot of a lot riding on this for the the state and the prosecution yeah well it's going to be look they've got a lot more to lose than i do i mean they've got five different lawyers and i've just got a barrister and that's it they've basically pulled out all the stops on this and there's been tremendous amount of resources on the on the part of the state in trying to prosecute me here they've directed an expert witness an epidemiolo epidemiologist and social scientist to, to produce a very lengthy report about why he thinks the law I've been charged with is necessary and applicable and, and a valid law. And uh, it's, it's, very, it's a very long-winded and complex document. But uh, he was cross-examined today as well, and I won't get into that specifically, but yeah, it's going to be very embarrassing for the state if they lose this. I expect them to win it because just purely the amount of fucking effort they've put into it, and also because the law is strictly against me. But uh, there's still a possibility that the judge could rule in my favour, and if that does happen, it will be very embarrassing for the government. 
Well, I'll leave it there for now, given that it is peak hour here in Melbourne. Yeah. Uh, there's a whole lot more oh, I want to ask you, but I'll do it another time. So yeah, thanks cool. for your time. Thanks, mate. Cheers. This is Will's Front, brought to you by theunshackled.net. So we're here on Thursday, the fourth day of Blair Cottrell's appeal trial here at the County Court of Victoria. I'm here with uh, his lawyer, uh, John Bolton. You're from Adelaide, so you've been here obviously every day this week since Monday, uh, four days. Uh, it'll wrap up uh, this afternoon. It's just been you as the sole legal counsel. There's two from the Director of Public Prosecution's office and then three from the Attorney General's department. That's right. The power of one. <laughs> and so what's it been like being that power of one? Obviously uh, there is a substantial uh, legal team with a lot of uh, resources uh, with them. So how have you uh, approached uh, this trial? Preparation. And of course uh, both the uh, DPP and the Attorney General are required to be model litigants. What that means is they're required to follow the processes and rules and the courtesies of court properly. And I'd like to take this opportunity to say, in my view, they actually have done that. They've, they've provided me in advance with the materials and the arguments and the, and the previous court decisions that they want to refer to almost without fail. And where they haven't, it has just simply been a slip. So taking all that on board, I was able to um, spend some long days getting prepared which is why I've been a bit short in uh, uh, speaking so much because I've actually provided to the court in writing my final response which I held off, I could have sent it last Friday but I held off until I had further details of how things were going and sent it through to the court. I think it was Sunday night or it might have even been Monday night. So the court has all of my responses to what the other parties are saying and I'm just going to tidy up slightly with about 10 minutes comment because uh, in my view the, the position they've taken on a particular case is not the position that I, is, is preferable to uh, Mr Cottrell and it's not the position I want the judge to take and that's, uh, well I can go into that particular case if you'd like. I've been here, uh, as I said, all four days uh, as well and it's been quite it's been a good, I'd say, crash course in how our legal system uh, operates. And yes, it's not just what you say and the, the opposing counsel say. As you said, there's written submissions as well. And then there's all this case law that are referring to the, uh, the, the, fold, the large uh, briefcases or suitcases that the lawyers carry around. They're full of case laws that they're planning to give to the judge and then he's got to read them all. So it's a lot of reading it's you spend a lot of hours i feel like i've been carrying uh, half the supreme court library around with me for the last three or four days because obviously i don't have four other people to carry my stuff i mean when i was in full-time practice i had nine ten people working for me so i did have that sort of assistance so I, it's been right back to basics for me doing a, all my own typing preparing all my own material and because of the speed with which it's been necessary, maybe it hasn't been uh, quite as typographically uh, perfect as I would like, but I think His Honour has given us a very good fair hearing. Yes, it, it certainly has, I think, flowed uh, well. At, at times I know the, uh, the gallery, obviously it's bogged down in a lot of constitutional case law. Obviously that's not your background uh, constitutional uh, law, but uh, uh, that didn't uh, deter you or you weren't daunted from, because originally you were going to go to the High Court but then you referred back to the County Court. Well there's a possibility uh, we may still go to the High Court as the uh, Attorney General's uh, barrister mentioned just before lunch. In fact he was um, loath to make certain admissions about um, whether or not what Mr Cottrell was doing was political. He inferred that the judge might well find that conclusion, but he didn't want to make the admission lest it go on to further appeal. And uh, obviously you mentioned there that there could still be this uh, uh, legal journey. You're obviously retired from standard well, legal uh, practice. So you're now known now as the, the Patriot lawyer. You're still prepared to keep going uh, uh, mentally keep going for however long uh, this process could uh, go on for well I had a good discussion with mr. Cottrell last night after court about all these issues 
and so we have discussed um, how things may proceed from today uh, but that's a matter of privacy for him so I, I won't go into that yep. um, but I retired very early I retired at age 57 due to the ill health of, of my wife who subsequently died and so uh, I'm Actually, my birthday was on Sunday, 66, and Blair's was on Monday, the day the court started. And mine's in five days. <laughs> so, um, and I, I feel very fit, although this week, some days, I was really tired. On Monday afternoon, I felt really, really tired. And uh, I went back to where I was staying, and I had something to eat and drink, and I went to bed about quarter to seven, and then woke up really bright and chirpy on Tuesday morning, started getting preparation, going about six, and I was feeling really good and on target um, come Tuesday morning. And um, then Tuesday afternoon, when you hear the opposition case, you get a little bit despondent, and then uh, I think it was yesterday where I was able to present uh, a summing up of Blair's case, uh, in particular the factual issues, uh, and felt quite good about that again. So, I mean, his honour will make whatever decision he makes, and then we have to see where we go from there. Yeah, I'm definitely glad I'm not you this week. <laughs> but well, there's no, there's no doubt that when one is standing making addresses, and you just know that there's something you want to say, if you have a solicitor at the other side of the bar table to hand you the piece of paper, or in the attorney general's case, to other people to give you hints and tips, it's got to be easier for anybody. Maybe we need a Patriot solicitor as well. Well, uh, you might like to ask Blair about that uh, because, as you rightly say, uh, constitutional law has never been my specialty, but uh, human rights has always been, and I've only been to the High Court ever once before. And I have been trying to find a person who would take on Blair's case, either a senior lawyer to me or senior barrister to me as a constitutional specialist or in which case I would be second fiddle quite happily or someone who would be a junior solicitor to me who could assist me in case preparation but uh, Blair has very limited financial resources and no one was prepared to take it on under the same conditions as I do. Uh, but I stand for freedom of speech and we just have to stand up and uh, I think as a society we owe people like Mr Cottrell the right to be properly heard and that's why I've been here for the last four days. And what I've learned in the past four days is that free speech in Australia is not on trial because we don't have free speech, a personal right to free speech. The only way that that can be done is by repealing the legislation which restricts free speech. That's got to be the only way. Many of the academic writers, uh, particularly Augustus Zimmerman from the uh, Western Australian University, says that acts like Section 18C and this Religious Tolerance Act need to go. I agree with him. Uh, well, the afternoon session is about to commence. Uh, thank you so yes. much uh, for your time. Uh, we shall uh, await the, the final judgment. Thank you very much. This is Wilms Front, brought to you by the Unshackled.net. So Blair Cottrell's appeal trial, uh, appealing his conviction under Victoria's Racial and Religious Tolerance Act, has uh, concluded on day four. Uh, he was uh, convicted in the Melbourne Magistrates Court along with uh, or Neil Erickson and Christopher Shortis were found uh, guilty in September uh, 2017 under Section 25.2 uh, of the Racial and Religious Tolerance Act for uh, inciting uh, contempt, revulsion uh, and severe ridicule of uh, Muslims under uh, this Act. Blair Cottrell and his lawyer John Bolton were appealing uh, the, his uh, guilty verdict and conviction under three grounds. First, appealing the actual charges itself and then uh, appealing that uh, the Racial and Religious Tolerance Act is inconsistent with the uh, Victorian Charter of Human Rights and Responsibilities and also with the Australian Constitution institutions implied uh, freedom to political uh, communication. Uh, so I've been here all four days of the trial. It is now concluded. The, the Chief Judge of the, the County Court, uh, Peter Kidd, who has been presiding over this case, has now reserved uh, his judgment. He said it will be delivered in uh, weeks, uh, not days, uh, given that the amount of case law uh, that's been put forth by both uh, John Bolton and the representative of the Director of Public Prosecutions, uh, Victoria, and also uh, by the representative of the state 
State uh, Attorney General uh, Jill Hennessy. Obviously, uh, I will be here uh, when the judgment uh, is uh, delivered. Uh, uh, our uh, analysis is that uh, Blair is most likely to win on the actual uh, charge itself because they have to prove that he intended uh, to vilify Muslims, uh, but uh, in terms of political communication and Victoria's Charter of Human Rights and Responsibilities, uh, as I already said uh, previously, we don't have a personal right to, to free speech in this nation. Uh, so the Racial and Religious Tolerance Act looks like uh, it, is a, it uh, will probably be able to stand, but will await uh, the final uh, judgment. Uh, that concludes uh, th my coverage on Wilmsfront and on the Unshackled.net and of course the Uncuckables. Uh, you can still view uh, my previous interviews and updates. I interviewed uh, Blair Cottrell and uh, John Bolton and of course I'll provide further news and analysis uh, when it comes. So thank you so much for following this. Thanks for tuning in to Wilmsfront. Visit timwilms.com or Rational Rise TV to view the archive of episodes. And keep visiting the unshackled.net to view all our shows and to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.